I got an email from a man in uh, in the area of Plauen, Germany, a man with the name of Andreas Brauer. And he told me he got his my email address off of our website. And I don't know how many other members of the 87th Division he also sent the email to. But the bottom line, he introduced himself, and I'd like to just read a little bit of what he said in that, in that email. He said, we are a group of Germans who are very much interested in history. We are engaged in different reenactment units, which display mostly units of the Third Army, including the 87th Division. We find it is now time to remember <coughs> the men of the 87th Division, which came in April 1945 to liberate this part of Germany from the Nazis where we live. This is the area around Plauen where the 87th arrived in mid-April and, st and stayed until they gave the area over to the Russians on the 1st of July, 1945. During the communist time, it was not very welcome to talk about that the Americans were the first here. So many things are forgotten meanwhile and documents are lost. But on the other hand, many elderly people who were just <coughs> kids at these times can remember still very well the American soldiers. Whenever I am within my Dodge Jeep in a small village, people start to talk. Our intention is to preserve this part of history for our children. That's why we would like to invite you. It would be a great pleasure and honor for having you here in Germany. We are preparing an event from April the 15th to the 18th, 2010. Remember, this is in August of last year. Uh, in and around Friend to remember the 65th anniversary of the liberation of Plow. We would be very glad if you have a chance to participate. And he goes on to tell what they planned in that event. Now what Jesse and I would like to do is to share with you uh, something about what went on with this uh, outfit. As it turned out, there were only five members of the 87th Division who went to see them. The five of us were Tom Stafford, who was in L Company 347, uh, Jesse Bowman, who you hear from today, who was in uh, Company D-345. Uh, Eldon Gracie, which was in the same company with me, A-345. Uh, there's B. And Gene Garrison, which was, I believe, in G Company of 347. Now, this was the man who organized the event. His name is Andreas Brower, <coughs> who's the one that I have been in correspondence and email now, it dates back over a year. Uh, incidentally, uh, he uh, was the head of the, what they call the Third Army Club, which is a group that is in American Army uniforms, have restored a lot of American World War II vehicles, and did a great job. Uh, he had, they met us, the five of us who came in uh, in, eight, in uh, April of this year, they met us at the Frankfurt Airport. And we had an email from him ahead of time saying you'll have no trouble recognizing me when you come through customs because I'll be in an American Army uniform and I'm six foot four. <laughs> You're right, we had no problem with him. They took us to this hotel, which is the best Western hotel in Plowin, and that's where we stayed for the days that we were in that area. They had gone all out in welcoming us and had things such as the uh, Statue of Liberty napkins for our meals at the hotel in Plymouth. Uh, the vehicles and the, uh, all they had had uh, this uh, detail on their, uh, their uh, windshields talking about this, uh, uh, this uh, special Liberty Convoy in flower from the 16th to the 18th of April 2010 with our emblem, we never forget the 87th stalwart and strong. <coughs> if you hear my voice breaking, it's because it was a very emotional experience for all of us to be there. This map shows where we were in this area 
This is the city of Plowin. This is the Czech border here. And this was the area around Plowin uh, in 1945. This then was where we were on the 16th of April when the uh, 347th Regiment came into Plowin. All of this was still the German line, the German forward line of the 7th Army. And you see here where it shows the 87th Division of the 3rd Army coming into Plow. This was what the city of Plow, this picture is in our division history. But this is what the city of Plow looked like when we came in. It had been a major uh, munitions and so on, a factory of manufacturing parts for the Messerschmitt and also parts for the Tiger tanks. And it had been very heavily bombed up till just a few days before we came in. Uh, and as we came into Plowing, and immediately days thereafter, there were hundreds and all thousands of German POWs that came in to surrender. Uh, we processed them in all sorts of ways. Now, when we started the, uh, the activities in Plowing, this is the American ambassador uh, to Germany. The name is Philip Murphy. Uh, he was a, 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 I'm sure he is a very good American ambassador. The only thing that I may have against him, he speaks excellent German, he is very personable, and I'm sure he's doing a good job. The only problem is that he was an executive with Goldman Sachs who raised a lot of money for Obama, and that's how he got the appointment as American ambassador. <laughs> Uh, he made a, a talk to us and posted a luncheon for us uh, in Plowin the first full day that we were there. Uh, we did went out about 10 miles from Plowin to an encampment where all of these reenactors in American Army uniforms and equipment uh, were in camp. And it was uh, from that camp on each of the three days that our convoy started to go around to all of the uh, uh, various towns and villages that were liberated uh, from the Nazis. It was very interesting to me that the people kept telling us that you did not liberate us from the German army. You liberated us from the brown shirts. Now the brown shirts was the Gestapo, the Nazi national police that literally kept the German civilians under control during the war. But these guys are all Germans. These are all Germans. However, and you'll notice uh, here the uh, 87th Division insignia, a lot of them wore that, and they had that on the on the Jeeps and did. Uh, they along with, and you'll see some pictures of them, uh, there was a, a number of, of Belgians there uh, that had come. These reenactors that are in American Army uniforms, up, they go all over Europe celebrating various anniversaries, including a large one that this group in Germany had gone to uh, observing D-Day. These are these were all German. This one that were dressed up as the company L the 347 for the guide on. And you, you'll know you'll, you'll see some of their, their vehicles and so on. Now, this, one, this was one of the reenactors that was dressed up as a British nurse. I never saw an army nurse uh, dressed quite like that. Quite like that. Uh, uh, she was she was uh, quite prominent uh, in, in, in this whole thing. Got a cross see, dress. Some of the others. This one has an airborne insignia on. This one, the second army, the second division, and so on. This one that you just see the background. He was dressed in, in tilt as a Scottish uh, reenactor. They had all kinds of vehicles. Excuse, These vehicles were amazingly restored. Was that nurse a man or a woman? Well, no, that, that was a woman. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you saw her, you, there was no doubt about that. <laughs> but the, the, the vehicles and so on were absolutely great. Uh, same like the utility vehicles, or what was it, that, that would be a personnel carrier, what would be the right designation? 
where the weapons carried. And, and every town that we went to, the vehicles all lined up in the park, and they got an awful lot of attention from the locals. <laughs> Even had an ambulance. Where did you can see a, 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 a six by six there in the background? Uh, there was even one Navy truck that had been actually bought uh, all the way from California by an American Navy veteran who brought it over there to be a part of this operation. <laughs> this was one of the towns that we went into, and in every town that we visited, there was a large crowd of people there to welcome us. A lot of signs, including uh, uh, welcome. You see one later where the a little poster said, God bless the American Army. This is one where we stopped at a big fire station, and you can see, the, again, the lineup of all these restored vehicles. This is Martin Stafford, and they had a number of, probably a half a dozen or so, of Ukrainians that were there in Russian World War II uniform. Again, they were not veterans themselves. They, too, were reenacted. Strangely enough, the Ukrainians had come to be a part of this victory convoy because they gave the American Army and the United States of America credit for the Ukraine now being an independent nation away from the Soviet Union after the wall came back. These are four of the Ukrainians, so two women and two, uh, uh, two uh, men. And another one of the friends with, uh, uh, this was uh, uh, Elton and Gracie, and two of the Ukrainians, and, and uh, me. Uh, each of us had uh, uh, on uh, something that identified us as, as uh, U.S. Army veterans. Although I don't believe that uh, uh, it was really necessary, because Americans kind of stand out as tourists or whatever, wherever they go. This was a Russian jeep that was there with the Ukrainians. Yes. Tom, is that your jacket? Is that uh, your yes, jacket? it is. I, uh, I, I'm impressed. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I wore, the, wore this jacket during the uh, uh, during our celebration. That identifies me as a, as, as an American. But that's uh, your. I have I have to tell you though, <laughs> this is not mine from World War II. Well, that's no, right. That's not what I scatter out and talk to the people, and they in turn would come up and, and talk with us. There's another Russian uh, uh, truck, and uh, it, it, it even looks Russian, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and the six by six was something behind it. Again, line up wherever we went, they parked the vehicles and uh, go around. You're talking about weapons. The, uh, they had American weaponry, uh, both individual weapons as well as everything. This one, they, uh, they, uh, third, I think that's probably a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on that Jeep. You'll see some others. Uh, you'll notice they had done authentic. They even put in the items that they put on some of Jeeps that were designed to cut any wires you know, that had been struck or cables from across the road. They were designed to take off the head of anyone coming through in the Jeep at high speed. Again, you see the kind of of how many crowds of people there were that welcomed us in these times. This is a little caliber machine gun mounted. The interesting thing is that the German government will allow them to have these weapons as long as they have been completely deactivated. They would not allow them to have bayonets. So none of them had bayonets, but they had the weaponry and saw so that you'll see. 30 caliber machine gun. 50 caliber machine gun mounted on one. Thompson submachine gun, carried on the front of a Jeep. The old grease gun that somebody was talking about earlier today. Even the old hand crank generators that were used by the American Army for, for radio uh, uh, power. Uh, they had one of the members of the reenactment group at the encampment. Uh, he was a dealer in American War memorabilia. 
and he had all of this stuff for, for sale of helmets and stocks for uh, guns and, and hats and so on. All over, they had these signs that had been put out along the route that we were going on, including uh, get, telling where the route was of the America of the Liberty Convoy, and says this project is in cooperation with the with the European Union. So it had been advertised and talked about all over. We had a police escort wherever we went. Uh, the uh, they. Uh, uh, with us, and they, they did a, a lot of good. They stopped traffic on the road when you come to an intersection, and uh, they, they were great. Uh, this was the convoy leader jeep. Uh, this happened to be in the, in the square of a tassel that we stopped at. We see a little more of. These two vans were ones that they supplied for those of those, us veterans that were there and members of our family. Uh, Norma went with me. Uh, Gene Garrison had his uh, wife, had a son and daughter-in-law and a grandson with him. And uh, uh, I guess that was, was that the only family members? Yeah. I guess so. But anyway, we rode in these uh, two white vans that were immediately behind the lead convoy of Gene. They were in our uh, interpreters. Yes. And uh, they had a sign when we stopped in a town. Each one of us veterans had an interpreter that kind of stuck with us, where we'd walk around and talk to the people, and so they, most, most of the folks we talked with would speak very good English. My German isn't much, but we managed to get by, it was a great experience. This way you can see the number of vehicles that came, this was coming into a, of a convoy into a place that was called the Kleine America. It was a restaurant out in the country that had managed to keep the name Little America even during the uh, East German occupation. This was going down the highway. One day, I rode in one of the Jeeps, but I found that it was too cold. So I only did it one day, and uh, these are the, the two vans up front and the line of the Jeeps. All along the way were people waiting and watching and waving. We also had a few protesters. It was interesting that they would have a protest sign blaming America for bombing Dresden and Plowing and Hiroshima. But they didn't say a thing about who started the war. <laughs> the police would get with the protesters only if they tried to disrupt. If they tried to use a megaphone or to disrupt or stop something, then the police immediately moved in on them as the police are doing here. And we uh, managed to get a couple of their, uh, their banners. <laughs> Again, you see our, our Scots. <coughs> but I like this. Can you imagine Germany from our time and our experience now having a sign advertising the Liberty Convoy and God bless the U.S. Army. Yeah. You, you see why it was a, an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. In every town where we stopped, this gentleman was a historian that spoke at every town telling the local townspeople that had gathered what had happened and all in that area with the 87th Division coming in. Uh, again, you see the, uh, the look, they got me doing something now. Uh, they uh, had him make his speech, and you you see all of this. This is Andreas Brower, the six foot four. This was again one of the interpreters, and these are other uh, Germans who are in American Army uniform. You see some they have picked up his bags. It was it was really a quite a quite interesting. <coughs> I find if you hit this very quickly, you have two at a time. Uh, this was the five of us, along with the Burgermeister in one town, who made a presentation to us. The crowds of people uh, taking pictures of, uh, of the veterans. Amazing crowds of people that were in every town that we came to. American flags shown everywhere. The other one over here is a uh, Czech Republic flag. 
This was in the uh, courtyard of the uh, of the castle that we visited in the small community. And this was a combo that they had playing Glen Miller music. <laughs> <laughs> this was the Burgermeister of that town. And uh, again, uh, here is a, a, one of our reenactors, and you see that he's carrying a Thompson machine, submachine gun. This is the Burgermeister who presented the uh, town flag to the, to the group. This gentleman is one who came up to me, uh, and he had a book that he wanted me <coughs> to autograph and put in 87th Division and what my company and regiment was. The type of the book was all in German, but I could see that it was about our division. The cover <coughs> was in English, and you can see the title, 75 Days Only. He spoke excellent English, and I said, tell me about the title. He said, your division liberated this area on the 16th of April. The Russians took over on July the 1st. We had 75 days of freedom. Wow. I did not have a dry eye. This was the Gottschalk Group. I'm not sure the pronunciation is right, but it is the tallest and largest all brick railroad bridge in Europe. And this is our convoy uh, coming in to it. It's an amazing structure. I tried to get a picture of a rail of a train going across the top, but they were they moved too fast when they get the camera out. We got a lot of pictures taken on us. <laughs> and I'll show you, this is what they were taking. They had us veterans standing here in the back and the children and the families that wanted their pictures taken with us. Tom, would you locate Garrison and Stafford on there for us? Would you point to Garrison and Stafford for us? Yes. Uh, this is Tom Stafford. This is Tom Stafford. Uh -huh. uh, this is Elvin Gracie. Of course, this is uh, Jesse, this is me, uh, and this is uh, Gene Garrison. Thank you. Gene Garrison was always cold. He kept his overcoat on most of the time. You can see how cold it was, but this was snow still out in the forest. This was one of the plaques that commemorated uh, the liberation of a slave labor factory. Uh, and this is the details of it. Any of you that read German can do it, but it uh, tells the fact that this was an area where they were making production for the Messerschmitt 109. This was another plaque in a slave labor factory. Uh, this happened, this one was in the Czech Republic was the last town that we went to on the third day of the three-day Liberty Convo. And in every one of these uh, plaques and so on, uh, they had arranged for the, the group of that had arranged and had uh, these floral banners and banners commemorating uh, that location. He, he, were the plaques up during the, uh, the Russian occupation? Or is that something that's happened since the wall fell? No, I, I, I believe that the plaques were put up after the Russian. <laughs> okay. Well, they, they, as so after they as, as, as like Greg Brower said, you couldn't talk about the Americans during the Russian uh, occupation. This was uh, all of us in front. This again is the uh, Berg, well, I'm not sure what you call the Bergemeister in, in uh, the Czech Republic, but he was the mayor. And this the, the five of us uh, uh, veterans. And uh, this was uh, uh, Andreas uh, Brower, who was the chairman, even carrying the American hand grenade. And he's got a, uh, uh, a M1 carbine. And uh, this one over here was the vice chairman. Uh, uh, his name was, anyway, uh, he was the vice chairman. He, he was carrying the Thompson submachine gun. <laughs> 
and we'll settle out it. And again, we'll fly to send those to do the Liberty Convoy plowing in 2010. This was an interesting flight. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Tom Stafford. Tom Stafford was the, uh, I would say he was technically the hero of this group. Uh, I'm not sure how they got any information about him other than what he had written himself uh, for the game. Most of his stories have been in the game. But this story, I'm not going to try and translate the whole thing. But basically it is saying that uh, this plaque commemorates the fact that Tom Stafford uh, <coughs> took personal heroic action to end the war and had 40,000 uh, Germans surrender to him. <laughs> <laughs> this we went into the town of Jaqueta. In the town of Jaqueta, there was a, this was the town square and all the vehicles around it with a lot of people coming out. This lady right here was 10 years old when the uh, 87th Division came in. Her family were very, very prominent in that town. And this was their home in 1945 that was taken over as the headquarters for the 87th Division for a short period of time. And in that home, she had us sit down at her table and she served coffee to us veterans using the Mison China that General Tudor and his staff had used when they were using that to sit down at the headquarters. She too had a copy of the book, 75 Days Only, and wanted all of us veterans to sign it. That's me signing the copy as, as she stood and, and looked on. Incidentally, she was very complimentary of, the, of the General Tudor and the headquarters. She said that they very carefully took their furniture and put it up on an upper floor and, and made certain that nothing was damaged. One of the main things, and Jesse, I'm going to ask you to step up and tell about the, the brief. Would you do that? I've talked long enough. <laughs> this is right. Uh, this is the Elster Brook Bridge, which uh, uh, Tom Stafford and uh, his platoon were given credit for saving from being blown up by the Germans. This uh, bridge was designated in 2007 as a European Union historical site. This is the bridge. It is now only a pedestrian bridge. At that time, it was the only bridge across the Elster River. And this shows, if you read your German, it says that this bridge was built in the year 1244. Rather historic. It was restored during 1979 to 1984 by the shot of the city of Plata. This was the uh, Consul General of the United States from Leipzig. Leipzig is the only American consulate that is in what was East Germany. She spoke excellent yeah. German. She is a career diplomat, uh, not like uh, the appointed ambassador. Uh, she stayed with us for the entire time of the convoy. And it was, it was a great experience. She was a wonderful lady. You uh, also see our nurse got in the picture, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a quick mention about the flag. The flag is a 48-star flag that I had. And I took it over there and gave it to the reenactors because I said, if you're reenacting things from 19... 45, you need a 48-star flag, and they <laughs> seem to appreciate it. Uh, where, where is uh, Norma? Norma, tell us about this. Well, um, I, my husband and I were 57 people in the 87 to 
and said that he spent most of his time picking cotton uh, in Mississippi. We <laughs> 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 talked with others who had worked in an apple orchard or an apple packing house in Michigan. Uh, I don't have a picture of him. Uh, we had other citizens that would came and would seek out us and give us bouquets of flowers, tulips in this case. This again was another one of the, uh, uh, of the, of the items of the, of the, of the plaque of the uh, tulip practice. And it says here the Second World War, uh, the Second World War, and it uh, 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 talks about the, uh, the, the, the tool fabric Melhauer, uh, Melstuer. Uh, which was a slave labor factory uh, and had been liberated by the 3rd U.S. Army on the 16th of April. Uh, this was one of the women who had been part of the slave labor in that factory. And it was an emotional thing of uh, talking with her. They served lunch to us each of the three days as we were on the Liberty Convoy. This is one you see our Ukrainians here in the front line. It was a lunch of bratwurst and rolls. And another one, they served us, we sat and we had uh, some kind of a, of a stew and uh, dark bread and pickles out of the town square. And then another town, they had it set up for us with a, of a buffet. But very, very interesting. Again, this was the story of the Liberty Convoy. Now, Jesse Bowman has some things that he particularly wanted to share with us about his experiences in plowing and on the convoy. Jesse, it's all here. I'm one of the World War II veterans. And I started with the 87th Infantry in Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Jackson. And I was with the 87th from the beginning on the Queen Elizabeth. The plow had a lot of experience. I was a gunner in that and company D, 345. And the reason plowing is so important to me, when we started in the war zone, I was wondering where we might end if we were still alive. And I'm sorry that many of them didn't see the plow. It was sad. But on the way, many, 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 many things happened. And it would take months to explain in detail. But when we got the plan, we didn't look like street soldiers. Really, the clock is bunch of fun. <coughs> Hair long, mustaches, beards, and dirty, clothes. Clothes that uh, look like they didn't drug through the hog pen. They had. <laughs> but one of, the, uh, one of the men in my outfit observed that Mulattoes need haircuts and shaves and clean up a little bit since the war was over, or is going to be over, because it, by the time before we got the plow, several days, it looked like well, the end could be, become the end any day. One of the guys wrote home and told his family to send some barber tools. About three weeks later, he got them. And he said, who wants these? And I said, I'll take them. And the day that the war ended, the next day, I sent some men down in the woods to cut me a tree about so big, about four foot long. They brought it up and dug a hole and put that hole in there for to sit on. And that was my first barber chair. <laughs> and you talk about hair flying. Yeah, we got cleaned up, we looked pretty good from here up. <laughs> but mostly I just cut it up so high and this part just come down. You, know? <laughs> you see the ears and the chin. 
So when we went back to plowing, I thought and I hoped that I'd be able to find that stone. But there was a whole new town. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't look like the one you saw while ago that had been bombed. But it, it was uh, it was amazing. It was amazing how how thrilled we were that the war was over, and how thrilled they were to get some of that hair off of the ears and the nose, to where we looked a little bit better. But why? I want to bring that point out is, I was a barber for 30 years after the war. After the war, I went home and uh, went to barber college and, and later on got my own barber shop and barber for 30 years. Well, I know that to the day that I was my first barber chair. And from that time on, it was, uh, it was a different story. But I like to go back just a little bit to the very beginning of our combat. It wasn't told this morning. But when we got off the train, after we left France, coming up to the Apple Orchard, it was a rainy, rainy, rainy time. And we marched up, up the hill a little ways, and there was a road right in front of us. And we hadn't dug in or anything yet. And there was a person leading a cow on the road. That's right on in the mountain park. And about two minutes after the cow got out of the picture, boom, 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 boom. That person called and told the Germans where we were. And we had casualties on the first day before we even got up to combat. I wanted to, I wanted to bring that party in. That was the first day. But many, many days after that, but when we got to plowing, that was something else. And during the time we were there, the five of us helped them to liberate their success. I have never in my life had so much encouragement, so much love shown, so much concern. Those people really love America. They were so glad that we liberated them from the Russians. You saw the, you saw the longest bridge in the world, the highest bridge built out of it. Some of that was the bottom was stone and then brick. But it was bomb. And uh, when the Russians came and took over, they they stole, they took the rails from Germany back to Russia. They stole a lot of, of the German property. Anything had any metal in it, they took it. And I have never felt like I did when I was in Plata. They made me feel like I was king of the United States. Uh, Tom, even I uh, look at him, he was a little bit taller than he was normal. <laughs> <laughs> he was so... <laughs> But the German people really are a loving people, and they showed us that while we were there. It was just simply wonderful. And another point I want to bring out, you've heard Tom talk about one man capturing 40,000 Germans. Well, if you get around a lot of the uh, World War II veterans, they might make you feel, uh, man, how did you do that by yourself? And again this morning, you heard Mr. Clark from Florida talking about his support by air. A 
and while I was in Plymouth, I was able to secure our German flag. It was a big flag, uh, bigger than this. It was about a four by six flag. Good plane cross on it. I took that thing home after I was discharged from Fort Bragg, I went to the supply company and they gave me a box of shoulder pads of all the outfits in in the Army, Air Force, the whole bit. I took them home and my wife and my mother sewed them on this German flag. And that German flag is now in the museum in my hometown. This represents not any individual, not any group. I didn't win the war. They didn't win the war. Who did? We did. We did. Without the Air Force, without the tanks, without uh, any other organization, we'd have never done it. But we won the war.
meals ready to eat, we call them MREs. And uh, what it is, it's just a compact system. I mean, everything comes in this bag. You, uh, you open it up, we'll demonstrate. And uh, it's, uh, it comes with its own heater. So you don't have to worry about any kind of flame or eating a cold meal. I mean, half the time you don't have time to eat it hot anyway. But uh, if you slow down, you can. You open one of these up, it comes with all kinds of different things. It comes with a condiment pack. These have matches, gum, toilet paper, seasoning salt. You can pass this around. It comes with a little thing of Tabasco for some meals. This one is a, uh, how many are there? 24 different MREs? 24. Yeah, 24. So this one is uh, number five, which is grilled chicken breast. It's not too bad. This is number 13, which is cheese tortellini. It's a vegetarian meal. <laughs> a lot of people like this because they come with the candy. <laughs> if you're out in the field, you take the vegetarian meals. It's the best ones. <laughs> It has uh, French vanilla cappuccino and some powder. As I pass these around, you know, you guys, we've got some in the other room. Feel free to take them home. Because we're not taking them back. Yeah, we're not taking them back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll show you here. The actual meal comes inside the part of the box. It's actually in one of these sleeves here. Uh, what you do, we'll demonstrate for you with the heaters. I'll go ahead and pass that around uh, so you guys can see what they come in. But all you do, yeah, that's the actual meal itself. And then, like, this is spiced apples. All it is is, like, apples and kind of like a pie filling, pretty much. It's just a dessert. So, yeah, well, sort of. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's actually pretty good. These have a, uh, a packet inside that reacts with water. So, you see the fill line here. It says, Do not overfill. You, uh, you tear this top off here. No, so no, no, no. it strikes out. But, like he said, what you do is you rip the top off, and then there, you have a fill line here, and you add water. And then all you do is you take your meal then, and you slide it down in next to the heater pack, and then you just close off the top. Typically then what you do is you just throw the box that the meal came in over top, Cooperate. And then you're supposed to lay it at an angle so all the water hits the heater and it activates the entire heater. But uh, if you be careful when you're not just carrying it around. But if you fill the box, it starts getting warm. And you don't, it'll eventually, after like an hour, I think it is, it'll just deactivate itself and stop drying. But it actually it gets pretty warm. It's about 20 minutes until it's hot. It's warm after about 10. Of course, if you're in Iraq, it takes a lot of time. The water don't spill out. While we're passing that around, this is what we use. It's called our uh, LBE. It's a load bearing fast. I'm sorry, LBD. It goes around the soldier like this. Distributes the weight. You put it on your ammo pouch. First aid kit and other stuff. Instead of a canteen now, we use what's called a camelback. Straps on your back, straw comes around, it's got a cap on it. You just keep piling it on the soldiers. That's right. Yeah, you just <laughs>
when they're riding a motorcycle for a long distance, they refer to it as a camel back. That makes it a lot easier to have the same thing. You have to have a lot of your hands. The camera was loud. Oh, the army just made their edge. But, yeah. Well, I know they're, like we were saying about the meals. They come with that. With the meals, they come up with uh, normally like a cheese and crackers or a peanut butter and crackers. This has peanut butter and crackers. I'll get it passed around for you guys. Then they normally come with like a type of dessert or a type of candy. This one came with M&M's and also uh, a lovely Army energy bar. Or horrible. One doesn't have a martini in it, does it? I wish. These are just your typical bag of M&M's. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I think that is great. Well, let's give my hand. I did not have a picture of it, but several of the Germans who yeah. had been American prisoners of war, they had kept a document that had been given to them in America before they were repatriated to Germany at the end of the war. Basically, it was English and German and certified that they had been a prisoner of war that they had not deserted the German army, but had in fact been captured and sent to America and were kept as POWs from the date of their capture. Kind of an interesting document. If there's any questions that you may have for us, Jesse or I'll be glad to stay around as long as you like, or you can continue to get up and leave if you want. Bob? Okay. Our Army friends here I spoke with during our break, I talked to Lieutenant Quinn, and after talking with Tom, I said, where is there a chance that we might have if they could leave somebody out there at the vehicles they parked out front? And so I asked, can they, at 3 o'clock when we break this afternoon, can somebody be there? And the answer was yes, they'd be very glad to. Thank you, Lieutenant Quinn. So I hope some of us folks will take advantage of it. We'll announce this again this afternoon after the session. So if you're planning your afternoon, figure maybe you go out there for 10 minutes and see what they use in the van instead of the Jeep and the Ford Thank you. Uh, remember, grab yourself some lunch now, and uh, we start back up at 2 o'clock, same room.